All right, so welcome everyone to another educational and inspiring AAM program. In this presentation, Vegan Outreach and Advocacy Expanded, Alex Hershaft will cover ways to advocate for animals other than street activism or in addition to street activism, such as writing letters to the editors and other creative actions. So my name is Michelle Granberg. I'm your moderator. I'm a mentor and team member with Animal Activism Mentorship. I'm located in New Jersey and I've been a vegan and activist for seven years. AAM is a multinational program supporting new and fledgling activists to reach their full potential. Our mission is to empower and equip activists to boldly participate in our global animal liberation movement. Founded in 2020, AAM offers a free three-month mentorship program which pairs experienced activists with aspiring activists. Through one-on-one -on -one mentoring, we generate an increased number of effective activists worldwide because we know this movement needs more activists. Additionally, we offer free workshops that train and educate our mentors, mentees, and the public. We have a podcast called the Animal Liberation Hour, and we host large-scale in-person activism events around the country. If you're interested in applying to become a mentor or mentee or want to get involved or to donate, please visit our website, animalactivismmentorship.com. Okay? Visit our YouTube channel as well, and please subscribe while you're there. Cool. So now I get to introduce our presenter. Dr. Alex Hershaft is the president of FARM and a co-founder of both FARM and the U.S. Movement for Animal Rights as a whole. Born in Warsaw, Poland, shortly before World War II, Alex survived Nazi persecution and sought refuge in the U.S., where he held a 30-year career in material science and environmental consulting, and a prominent role in the movement for religious freedom prior to dedicating himself to animals. Alex organized the first animal rights national conference, conference, World Day for Farmed Animals, Meat Out, and a dozen other initiatives, and was indicted, inducted into the, indicted, that's on our minds, and was inducted <laughs> to the animal rights and vegetarian halls of fame. So please hold your questions until we invite them uh, throughout and after the presentation. Feel free to comment in the chat, but as always, keep it respectful. Please be kind to one another. All right, Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. So go ahead. All right, well, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, AAM. And thank you all for coming. I realize you could have done any number of things tonight, but you chose to be here with us and I do appreciate it. Uh, tonight, I will be covering a six hour course in advocacy, but fear not in only 40 minutes, but I won't be able to get into any details. My purpose is simply to expand your concept of advocacy beyond what it may have been. I will be happy to email a copy of tonight's presentation if you send me an email at uh, alex at farmusa.org. Additional details of what I will be presenting are published on uh, my blog at uh, theveganblog.org. Again, that's theveganblog.org. Uh, finally, as Michelle indicated, I will be stopping along periodically for questions. So on January 30th, 1933, uh, the Nazi regime came to power in Germany. In less than three years, they enacted the infamous Nuremberg Laws, 
declaring Jews as inferior, not deserving of German citizenship or relations with Christians. And the dissidents were placed in concentration camps. The Holocaust would begin six years later. In a single decade, the citizens of the most enlightened country in the world became the most evil and despised people in the world, leading to the deaths of an estimated 80 million people or 3% of the world's population. The slaughter of animals for food began much earlier and is expected to continue much longer, unfortunately. There are a number of parallels between the Holocaust and the slaughter of animals for food. And the most important of these is that both are tragic expressions of social norms that induce otherwise normal, decent people to commit or to enable unspeakable atrocities. This is the short answer to the frequently asked questions, how could it happen and can it happen here? Social norms govern the relations between members of the society, as well as between the government and the governed. They are typically shaped by our collective needs, desires, and morals, by political, religious, and other social influencers, but also by technological breakthroughs, like the advent of personal computers, the internet, social media, and the smartphone. Social change tends to occur in stages, defined by what people know about the need to change and how they feel about it. For the purpose of this discussion, uh, we can refer to an alerting stage, a discussion stage, and a reform stage. In the alerting stage, people are not aware of the need for change. The role of social influencers like us is to inform the public about the existence of a social problem and potential solutions, perhaps by dramatic march, uh, tactics like marches, street theater, and sit-ins. This is where our movement was in the last three decades of the 20th century. Uh, the, that's the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Before then, eating animal flesh was universally considered vital to human survival, so it was not subject to discussion. Transition to the, tra the next stage, the discussion stage, uh, may also be precipitated by so-called tipping points, typically books or documentaries that stimulate public interest and discussion. Uh, publication of The Jungle by Upton Sinclair in uh, 1905 first alerted the public to the revolting conditions in American slaughterhouses and led to the creation of the Food and Drug Administration. The 1962 publication of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson laid the groundwork for the environmental movement. The 1971 publication of Diet for a Small Planet first gave us permission to survive without animal flesh. The 1975 CBS documentary, The Guns of Autumn, exposed the cruelty of hunting. In the next the discussion stage, people show appreciation of the problem and the interest in the proposed solutions. They seek more information. This is where some of the remedial legislation is drafted and debated. The use of animals for food is actually at this stage. 
This is important for us to know. And our efforts should reflect that by speaking and distributing helpful information about the merits of animal-free eating. Finally, in the reform stage, uh, most people agree with the need for change, but substantial reforms are lagging behind. Enactment and enforcement of radical legislation like the 1964 Civil Rights Act is a common solution. Offering of plant-based milks to school children is probably at this stage because of the health and racial implications, if not because of the concern for the animals. So different issues basically are at different stages. Most of our issues are at the discussion stage, but there are a few select issues that are at the reform stage. So we should be aware of that and make sure that our tactics comport with where the issue is. Trigger events, so-called trigger events, are dramatic social incidents that precipitate lingering reforms. So for example, the 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York, where 146 garment workers died because of unsafe working conditions, led to enactment of fire safety codes and formation of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. In other words, people realized that there were fire safety issues before, it's just that they were not enforced. And this, this, uh, this was a trigger event that, that brought about enforcement, national enforcement. The killing of four Kent State University war protesters in 1970 precipitated withdrawal from our highly unpopular military involvement in Vietnam. In other words, the, the war was already unpopular, but the killing is what finally precipitated the last act. Technological advances have introduced social changes favoring animals in uh, our social norms. The invention of kerosene stopped our wholesale slaughter of sperm whales for lamp oil. The development of the steam, then the internal combustion engine, ended the exploitation of horses and mules for transportation and agricultural labor. The promising development of plant-based and cultivated meat may one day put an end to our barbaric social norm of slaughtering animals for food. It is important to note that all groups, institutions, and jurisdictions have their own social norms, not just countries. The smaller the jurisdiction, the, the easier it is for us to influence its social norms. The institutions of particular interest to us, for example, are our local school districts because they affect our children's lunch menus, textbooks, uh, opportunity for guest speakers, and so forth. An effective way to affect our community social norms is through letters to editor. This should be about uh, a recent or an upcoming event in the community or in the nation. It should have a gentle folksy tone as if you were talking to your neighbor and run between 150 and 200 words. 
Other means of affecting your local social norms include tabling and leafleting at community events. Of course, you're familiar with that. <clears throat> so thus far, we have been talking about affecting the social norms of our countries and communities. How about personal advocacy in addressing groups, friends, and associates? This is our next section, and I will stop here briefly for questions. Okay, so you want to open up for questions a bit, Alex? That is fine. Any questions for Alex so far about what he has shared or? If not, we'll be glad to continue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're pausing here for any quick questions. Okay, Mohan, do you have a question? You have your hand raised, go ahead and ask. Yes, hi, Alex, thank you for the seminar. Um, my question is, do you think it is a good idea to draw comparisons between uh, animal agriculture and the Holocaust, or could that be more problematic because it's uh, controversial? It, it is not a good idea. Uh, I never bring this up to strangers. I only respond when I'm asked. There are amazing, absolutely amazing parallels between those two tragedies. But uh, the comparison draws such strong negative emotional response that people are just become unwilling to listen to any additional explanations. So I don't recommend bringing it up. Thank you very much. Sure. That was a great question. Yes, good question. Really good question. Comes up, comes up. Yeah, I'm glad he brought it up. It comes up and we may have been thinking that. And, and do you want to see if there's any other question or Alex, you can go uh, on. I well, guess you can go on. You know, there'll, there'll be time at the end to ask more questions. Good. All right, so let's talk about some other interesting stuff. Something called social frames. Social frames are the mental lenses through which we perceive the world around us. So we don't have to question everything we hear and see. For example, when we came to this session, we were, we kind of knew what was going to happen. We kind of knew who I was and what you would hear. So you, you expected this pretty much. I mean, there are little things that, uh, that, that you didn't expect, but mostly it was all expected because you were looking at this through this, through your social frames, which again are formed by your social norms. So the reason this concept is important uh, is, uh, because, uh, is because your message has to fit within your listener's social frames. And uh, we'll get into more details shortly. Uh, so basically, we need to we need to find out what the social frames of our audience is, and to figure out how both we as the messenger and our message can gain acceptance. Now, in most cases, uh, if we're talking to an individual, say if it's a if it's a friend then obviously you, you know all of that. But if we're talking to a group, we may not. And we have to use certain devices. So for example, uh, the best way to get past uh, your listeners' uh, social frames are for both you and your message to be both credible and likable. So for the message to be credible, it should be similar to what the audience already knows. 
it, it should come from a trusted source. In other words, you could quote somebody they respect. It should be logical, accurate, or could be based on personal experience because no one can question your personal experience. You are the ultimate authority. So if you're telling stories about your own life, you're ultimately credible. Uh, and, your, and your message is credible. For the messenger, in order to be credible, uh, it helps to have some credentials. It helps to or else quote an authority, somebody your audience considers an authority. Or again, report on a personal experience. You're an expert on that. Uh, it helps to be introduced by a respected member of the audience. Uh, it helps to point out that you don't have any personal gain from your message. You're not selling a used car. You're not going to benefit from it personally. <clears throat> and how to be likable. <laughs> well, for the message to be likable, again, it needs to be similar to what the audience already knows. <clears throat> and uh, there is a negative aspect too. It, it should appeal to the audience's fears and desires. It should be evocative of imagery, if you can do that. And uh, again, based on personal stories. For the messenger, you as a messenger to be likable, it helps to dress like your audience. It helps to call on any commonalities you can between you and your audience. Maybe there is some ethnic affinity, uh, maybe geography, maybe you went to school uh, in the state where you're speaking, uh, maybe it's gender, maybe it's a profession, whatever commonality you can think of between you and the place where you're speaking or the audience that you're addressing is helpful. And of course, to be friendly, sincere, good humor helps a lot. You don't have to, you don't have to tell jokes necessarily, but just be smiling and good humored. Now, what if uh, what if you don't know anything about your audience? What if uh, what if you're maybe you were planning on speaking? Maybe you were just called to the microphone because you asked the question, or maybe, you know. There are still certain devices you can use for positioning yourself within the frames of the audience. You can, there are certain, what I call generally safe positions to advocate from. Among these are opposition to animal cruelty. You know, we're all opposed to animal cruelty, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> we're, we, we all favor healthy foods. We all want to reduce global warming. We all want to make this world a better place. So you can start with these and, and you, you're already starting in the common place and, and just go on from there. Okay, let me turn to a couple of devices that are extremely helpful in uh, advocacy. And those devices are language and rhetoric. And now rhetoric is a way of phrasing our message that meets the acceptance requirements uh, of similar, similarity and credibility, likability that we just spoke about. In other words, how do you phrase your message? How do you present it so that it meets these requirements? In December of 2010, American activist Gary Urofsky 
delivered one of his many, many college talks at Georgia Tech University in Atlanta. In July of 2012, two years later, two young Israelis started promoting a 70 minute video of the talk. They called it the best speech you will ever hear. The results were electrifying. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis went vegan practically overnight and Israel became the world's most vegan friendly nation. The video has now been seen nearly 6 million times and it offers an excellent representation of the power of effective rhetoric. You can find it easily just by going to YouTube and entering in a search panel something like Gary Best Speech or something like that. You'll, you'll find this, <laughs> no trouble. And, uh, and when you watch it, again, it's a little long. It's, uh, it's 70 minutes, an hour and 10 minutes. But, but pause and, and consider the devices that he uses to get past any hostility or past any defense mechanisms of his audience. He does not know his audience. All he knows is that there are a bunch of students at a fairly conservative school. And uh, he knows that they think of him as this radical rabble rouser uh, with this weird concept of animal rights and, uh, and not eating animals. So, so they're, they're set up for a disaster, so to speak, and how, how he bridges that gap and how he manages to become very convincing at the end. It's a, it's a masterpiece. Okay, how about language? Well, uh, I, again, will direct you to my essay on the subject in the veganblog.org, but I will take time here to address two language topics. One is to ask you to please not use the term vegan diet in your advocacy. And I will explain. The warm and fuzzy feeling that veganism engenders in our minds is not shared by the general public. Surveys indicate that it is viewed with the same degree of cultish imagery and aversion as Scientology and Mormonism. Moreover, the term diet bears the connotations of ill health, something temporary and restrictive and depriving. It's not, a, it's not an attractive term. Instead, let's use terms like plant-based food, if, if you're talking to a food-minded audience, or animal-free food or eating for animal-related occasions. Next language item, people are much more likely to change their actions than their identity. Talk to them about considering the delicious, healthful, convenient plant-based meats, milks, cheeses, and ice creams in their supermarket. Talk to them about the health and environmental merits of these products. But please avoid any suggestion that you're recruiting them, that you're asking them to join something, to become somebody that they are not. They don't ask them to change their identity. Okay, the second part of personal advocacy is identifying pain points. Now, understanding social frames helps us communicate and be accepted by a prospect 
assuming that the need arises. But how do we get the need to arise? How do we get the prospect to sit still and listen to us? Can we create or find such a need? Yes. They're called pain points. Uh, this is a dramatic expression used in today's sale courses to describe basically an unmet need or an unsolved problem. And the best way to explain that is by giving you some examples. So let's say you're talking to some athletes. What are their pain points? Well, they want to improve their performance, their endurance, their recovery time. How about parents? Well, maybe their kid refuses to drink milk. Yeah, is that an occasion to, to bring your message? Uh, sedentary folks, uh, how to maintain healthy weight without exercise? Now that, that should get an audience. Uh, if you're talking to seniors, you can give them the formula to retain their youthful appearance and vigor. You can tell them about this friend you know who is 90 years old but looks like he's 60. And, uh, and remains in good health. Uh, the Generation Zers, how to reduce greenhouse emissions yet keep your car running. Uh, the Romantics, how do I get her or him to like me more? The Woke folks, shouldn't animals have some rights too? <clears throat> Uh, needy students, <laughs> you could pay them a dollar to watch a four minute video. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I'm not joking. We actually did this. We had a program called 10 Billion Lives uh, where we went around to colleges and rock concerts uh, with a van uh, that contained kiosks with uh, video screens and we paid students a dollar to watch our four minute video. And uh, it's amazing the results we got. You wouldn't think that, but, but it really works. Anyway, it's, I know it's a little sad because you would think that, that people will be willing to defy their social norm just because it's the ethical thing to do. But unfortunately, it really helps to have some pain points to work with. You can also use special occasions like meet out, vegan Earth Day, World Day for Farmed Animals as a pretext to address your friends on social media. <clears throat> Short videos are highly effective also. I recommend our 10 billion lives. It's still on YouTube. 10 is the number, but billion is spelled out. So 10 billion lives dot org, or just enter 10 billion lives on YouTube or wherever. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's just a uh, search engine. We also offer a superb catalog of animal free videos with many different angles on our veganvideos.org website. Again, that's veganvideos.org. Uh, this is a good stopping point for questions. I agree. Okay, so let's open it up for a question or two. Let's try to just stay on topic for now in terms of what Alex just shared, a whole lot about messaging and knowing your audience and language and words to use and the attitude you want to bring and using humor and using pain points and social frames. So much good information. Bobby, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you believe that... Um, 
disruptions are equally counterproductive as they are productive? Being that they don't create a space for open discourse or respect. Right. Um, disruptions in, uh, are pretty much uh, last century. They're, that's that's pretty much the the first stage. This is this is what we did in the seventies, eighties, nineties. Today, the the time has passed. In in most cases, disruptions I would say are counterproductive today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bobby. Great question. There's a question in the chat from Tenebrae. What is the best way, Alex, to get around the deeply entrenched, unexamined social frame of human supremacy, where people are feeling their identity is being attacked? Yes. Uh, well, so I that's that's a tough one. <laughs> And I, I, I generally try to avoid that. Uh, so when we, uh, this is almost a whole separate discussion because the whole subject of the philosophical legitimacy of animal rights, you know, people come up with issues and questions like uh, can animals, abide by a social contract. So generally it's assumed that if you have rights, you also have obligations to the society that gave you the rights. And my answer, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm talking philosophically, is that yes, a lot of our family animals do abide by a social contract. Uh, cats uh, abide by the need to relieve themselves in the in a special container dogs actually have uh, more obligations they not only have to relieve themselves outside they also have to greet us when we come home they also have to bark at strangers they also have to snuggle with us on the couch so they they our our home, our family animals do abide by a social contract of sorts. But, but really, uh, if I am pressed on, uh, on the legitimacy of animal rights, you know, uh, yes, animal rights is an invention of us. We invented animal rights, but so are human rights. I mean, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness famously advocated by Thomas Jefferson in 1776, what is, the, what is the, the credibility, the source he claims for that? He, <laughs> he assigns the source as, uh, as self-evident. He says it's self-evident. Well, to us, animal rights are self-evident. <laughs> so if I'm really pressed, I basically dismiss it by saying, look, you don't like animal rights. It's not about them, it's about us. It's about how we relate to the most uh, vulnerable and therefore the most oppressed sentient beings on earth. <laughs> so that's how I, get out of the dilemma of uh, human superiority. Okay, we have another question from Mohan. I'm going to read to you, Alex. Is it a cop out to talk to people about the environmental angle while ignoring the more important ethical issues? Ah, good question. <clears throat> so that's uh, that's something. So if, if you assume the role of an advocate, that's a fancy name for a salesman. You are selling a concept and uh, you have to adapt, to, in order to be successful, you have to adapt the tactics 
that salesmen have developed for selling used cars. I'm sorry, but that's the reality. And whatever works, if you want to be effective. Now, you can, you can be, remain uh, iconoclastic and idealistic and, uh, and just stick to your little narrow message, but you will not make many sales, I'm afraid. Okay, great. So do you want to do one more question from Laz? Um, do you want to go on? Well, either way. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask you the question. Uh, to what extent is graphic imagery vital to making the case for animal rights? And how adamant should we be about watching this kind of content? I guess watching it ourselves as well as showing it? Sure. What do you think? Yeah, no, that's a lot of good questions. My gosh. Uh, so this is really, this is really, yeah. I don't, I don't have a definitive answer. I'll, I'll just give you some of my thoughts. So, for us as activists, I think it's important. So when I was uh, still running our organization farm, uh, I used to take my staff to a slaughterhouse every couple of years just to just to remind everyone that whatever they were doing all day long pushing paper and pencil this was before we had computers uh, that, that that there were real animal lives attached to that that this wasn't just an a paper exercise. So I felt it was important for my staff to, to go there and try to stop the trucks and try to feed some water to the pigs. Uh, is it important for, I would say it's, I'm sort of harking back to the previous question, whatever works, if, uh, if you feel that your prospect Need <laughs> you know needs the so-called shock treatment, you know maybe maybe they need to see a slaughterhouse picture. Uh, in general, uh, you know I, I, I would not that would not be my first step. So just yeah, whatever it takes. All right. I, I, I know. Do you hear me? Yes. Is my, is my microphone on? Hello? Yes. Yes. Okay. Is I that, noticed that, Is that our friend Jim Mason? Yeah, I see a question from a uh, person here about graphic imagery, and that brings up a thought I've had for some time that the animal movement has had a tradition of showing the gore, the unwatchable scenes of skinning animals and slaughterhouse and all oh, this most unwatchable stuff. And lately, since I'm doing social media, I noticed a lot of um, film clips, mostly at TikTok and so forth, that show really warm and fuzzy, cuddling, heartwarming images of animals, showing affection, showing play, showing the kinds of things that are so watchable and so relatable. So I'm just going to suggest that the movement think more about showing those kinds of graphic imagery to get people uh, to see the connection, to see the familiarity, the continuity between us and the other animals. Uh, just the other day, I, I saw a heartwarming video, I think, of a kitten or a kitty snuggling with a baby pig. You know, they... <laughs> animals of different species get along better than than we do with their own brothers and sisters. So just wanted to plant that thought for activism. Yeah, I certainly agree. By the way, for those of you who don't know Jim, this is Jim Mason. This is the man who turned me into veganism and animal rights in 1980. I'm forever grateful to you, Jim. Well, you helped. 
promote my book. So the gratitude is mutual. Okay. All right. I like this mutual admiration society. Yeah, so right. Thanks. Jim's book is an unnatural order for anyone who would like to get it if you haven't already. But thanks for your great question. And before that, the uh, animal factories. The yes. Book, the book that first turned the national attention to the plight of animals in factory farms in 1980. Yeah, the younger activists probably can't imagine that when Alex and I were young activists, the animal movement hadn't even discovered farmed animal issues yet. It was off the table. Isn't that right, Alex? Yeah. None of, none of the big uh, humane societies had any program whatsoever on farmed animal uh, issues, let alone factory farming. Yeah, for the the first 20, 25 years of the movement, <clears throat> Farm uh, was the only organization uh, dealing with uh, farm animal issues. Everybody else was focused on vivisection pretty much. All right. Uh, this is the, the last phase here of my presentation the closing remarks. So we've been talking about advocacy, but there is another element, which I think is the most challenging and also the least considered aspect of our advocacy. And that is retention. If you've worn a vegan t-shirt, you have probably heard comments like, Oh, I was a vegetarian once. Mm. Indeed, a recent survey indicated that as many as five out of six former vegetarians and vegans have regressed to eating animals. Now, even if you have problems with the survey, I think we all acknowledge that retention is a big challenge. A likely reason is lack of social support. People just get tired of living outside their society's norm and having to constantly justify their diet to others on social occasions. One attempt to provide such support has been Israel's Challenge 22 program. Here, new vegans, few hundred at a time, are assigned to a closed Facebook group that is monitored by a vegan chef, a nutritionist, and an expert on social relations. Each day for 22 days, hence the name, they are assigned a challenge, hence the name, exploring plant-based meats in their supermarket, checking out vegan offerings in their local restaurants, or taking a friend to dinner. Each day, they report to the group on their challenge and any problems they encountered, get their questions answered and get their support. Now, I understand in practice that has not quite worked out as expected, but I think it's a very promising, very worthy concept. And the final section is the question that I phrase as animal rights or animal lives. So people have a natural affinity towards animals. Well, we all do, obviously. Animals are an integral part of our fondest childhood memories. Toy animals were the very first objects we handled in our cribs. Our beloved fairy tales, our early movies revolved around animal lives. Our family dog gave us unconditional love. 
when our own siblings and classmates made our lives hell. Most people would be delighted to join the animal rights movement that did not require them to change their lifestyle three times a day. That will become a reality, of course, once the use of animals for food has been consigned to the garbage heap of history. Because of these concerns, some animal rights for uh, advocates feel that animals are best served at this stage by reducing their number in the food stream by promoting rather than promoting the animal rights ideology. Once again, as I mentioned earlier, the best hope for ending the use of animals for food lies with advancing technology, particularly with the development of plant-based and cultivated meats, as well as grain and nut-based dairy products. We can best help by demanding these products in our schools and workplace cafeterias, in our favorite restaurants, and among our friends and associates. I thank you for your patience and your attention, and we're open to questions. All right. Thank you, Alex. Really, really great getting us thinking. So questions for Alex then about changing our food system, about being better activists, about what he has shared. Laz, go ahead and unmute yourself, ask your question. Um, I asked a question in the chat earlier. Okay, go ahead. Um, but, your next. Go yeah, ahead. my question was um, about using personal experience because um, they can just respond with their own personal experience to shut you down, like saying they tried a vegan diet and didn't feel well, and you can't really argue with them without like making them like basically telling them they did it wrong, you know, because then th they're not gonna. I mean, I don't because I don't want to get into like what what were you eating and then like arguing with them. So how do you? How do you deal with that when they come back to you with a personal experience that you can't really argue with? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, their, their personal experience is just as valid as yours. And uh, just as I'm advocating, this is a powerful tool of advocacy. It can also be a powerful counter tool. I have never run into uh, people challenging me on the basis of their personal experience, but I guess it's possible. But that shouldn't stop you from using your personal experience because it's still powerful. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So now, Laz, you have your question. You can unmute. Howdy. So I, in my advocacy, tend to adopt a certain notion um, that the people I'm speaking to that aren't yet vegan, um, I'll try to kind of think of them as pre-vegans because um, I feel like when most people are confronted with the information in their, of the state of mind that they're able to consider that information clearly, that it's kind of a logical um, decision um, to uh, be vegan. I wanted to know what your thoughts were on that, um, if that's maybe uh, not a good idea or something going forward. Sure. It's okay for you to think of them as pre-vegans, but please don't call them that because that may suggest that you have some sinister plans for them, which they may not appreciate. Just talk to them about the virtues of plant-based animal free eating and don't 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 give it a, a name that's associated in some minds with a cult. If I can add really briefly, um, I I suppose I 
think this way kind of um, in response to um, the way we kind of refer to people who aren't vegan as non-vegans. And there tends to be kind of like this, um, like othering that happens in our society that I, I guess I'm trying to like remedy in some sense, but. Um, sure. Yeah. No, I, I think it's helpful for, for you as an advocate to think of people as pre-vegans because that, that enhances your hope of getting them to turn away from animal products. Okay, is that, is that good, Les, as I answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right, uh, additional questions then. All right, um, Tessa's asking a question in the chat, Alex. How about religious aspects? I guess, you know, when Genesis, Revelation, when they talk about animal, eating animals is in these documents. And what do you say to that? Well, I'm not disputing what what revelations say. Is I just don't. My life is not governed by revelations. I don't think anyone's life. Well, I mean, some people's lives are governed by their own personal interpretation of revelations. I think everybody has their own interpretation, but no, that's that's totally uh, an non sequitur. I mean, uh, uh, now I, I'm not aware of any. I mean, I I know some religions uh, require animal sacrifices, but I'm not aware of any religion that actually requires their adherence to eat animals. And of course, there are religions like Jainism and Buddhism and Hinduism, which at least originally required people to refrain from eating animals. I bet that's, Jim Mason could. Jim that's, Mason a, that's, could a, a, that's a shame, by the way. You know, there are, there's something like, I forget the, the exact number, something like 2 billion Buddhists in the world. And of course, the original Buddha was vegan, as far as I, as far as we know. But the, the two billion followers, <laughs> unfortunately, don't follow his style. Yeah. Yeah. There's a wonderful organization called Dharma Voices for Animals, and they're actually doing outreach with Buddhist monks and Buddhist communities because of that. Any other? questions i think i was going to ask you alex what about sharing our vegan story when we're outreaching and talking about how we used to eat animals uh well if it yeah i think that's i think that's helpful it, it, it needs to be within the context so for example if uh, the person you're talking to <clears throat> presents a problem that you faced yourself, then, then it's helpful to note how you, how you dealt with that problem. But uh, I think everybody you talk to assumes that you became a vegan at some point. Gotcha. Know your audience, know who you're talking to if you can. So Mo Mohan, do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um... I would love to know, Alex, your your view on the philosophical question about wild animal suffering, and what does that matter, and is that something we should do something about as humans? Yeah, yeah. Again, good question. This is something that was uh, raised uh, about five years ago for the first time, to my knowledge, by uh, by. Uh, Belgian activist named uh, Tobias Leonard, who is still very active in the vegan movement in Europe. Uh, he, <laughs> uh, my, yeah, I, I've given it some thought. Uh, 
my position is that we are only responsible for ourselves. We cannot be re responsible for other people or other animals. It's, I, I think it's really unfortunate that some animals eat other animals, but uh, I don't think it's my place to change that. Could that be turned around though to say it's not our place to change other people from eating animals? Uh, no, because uh, we, well, a couple of reasons. Uh, the most basic reason is that who, for us, it's a choice. It's not a necessity. Lions don't have a choice. And uh, for another, uh, we have the power to change the eating habits of other humans. We don't have the power to change the eating habits of wildlife. Great questions. No surprise that we're getting great oh, questions. Oh, questions. Amazing. You know, I usually, uh, I, I mean, really thought provoking stuff. Well, I could say something about the wildlife issue, if I may. Uh -huh. It occurred to me that we don't really have to intervene. What we have to do is reduce our footprint, our presence, our numbers, our consumption. We actually have to get out of the space where animals can be, you know, carry out their natural um, behaviors without our interference, because we, we basically uh, dominate the entire earth with our industries and our agriculture and our pollution of the waters. I mean, we, we affect wildlife in so many ways. If we would just stop and pull back a lot of that, then the wildlife would be free to do their thing without us having to interfere with, say, the wolf chasing the baby deer or whatever. Absolutely. Jim, did you want to add anything about religion? Well, it's uh, interesting, I, as you may know, I. I look at religion a lot as part of the story of my book. Uh, and uh, it, it occurred to me and all that, that a lot of our religious ideas and rituals and practices show the discomfort that we've had for the longest time with killing animals. Um, and the most obvious example to a lot of you is the, the, the uh, ritual of kosher slaughter, which basically is a, uh, indicates to me that the killing of an animal has to be done with some reverence, you know, with some, doesn't make it all right for me. But what I'm saying is it shows some discomfort, some anxiety about the killing of an animal. And I think other religions have shown this. And the best example back through the ages is the ritual of animal sacrifice in the temple uh, I don't know how many of you have studied that. It's kind of an obscure subject, but according to the tradition, whether it was the ancient Romans or the Greeks or the others who did animal sacrifice, the priest that did the killing had to apologize to the animal. That was part of the ritual. It was kind of like a prayer to the gods and to um, apologize to the animal for taking its life. So there have been so many examples um, throughout history. And, and of course, the hunt rituals. I don't know if you're familiar with the rituals of pre-agricultural hunting societies, but the, the hunters had to usually perform elaborate rituals. Sometimes they'd go on for days before the party, the hunting party, went out to kill an animal. They, they didn't do it casually. They did not do it lightly. They had to go through some emotional gymnastics to do this thing, which tells me that we maybe have always had a kind of a reluctance to do this, but we did it anyway. So it's something to think about. 
Of course, today we just disguise the killing. We don't have to experience it. We're not anywhere near it. Someone else does it for us. By the time we see the meat, it's all neatly packaged and it doesn't even look like anything from an animal. So that's how we do it today. True enough. Doesn't look like a corpse. Okay, thank you very much, Jim, for adding that. Alex, anything you want to add to that as well? No, I, I, I totally agree. In fact, it's my understanding that the laws of Kashrut were first formed uh, uh, after the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans. Yeah. And uh, sacrifices were no longer possible. And uh, people were trying to figure out, you know, what to do next. And, uh, you know, they wanted to use animals for food. and. Uh, the Jewish sages said, well, okay, uh, if you insist, you can, but you have to observe these laws. Yeah. Again, it showed the, an emotional discomfort with the, the killing. So they had to come up with some hoops to jump through to make it acceptable. And religion has helped do that. Absolutely great. There's a whole other workshop in all that. Any other questions for Alex? Alex, I'm wondering if you want to talk anything more about how the movement being in it for so long, how the movement has changed and what gives you the most hope. Sure, uh, that's my favorite subject. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so when you know when we first got started, uh, as Jim was mentioning, uh, for me it was well for both of us it was actually well Jim started a little earlier I think Jim started uh, in the early seventies I started in the middle seventies, but uh, there was no movement yet. So basically, there were some individual organizations and some individual activists and uh, the in the big the big event was it took place in 1975 and that was the world vegetarian congress held in the united states for the first time and uh, that's when i finally realized that my vegetarianism, which was very personal and hidden. This is where, this, that was my coming out part, so to speak. This is where I came out as vegetarian, when I was no longer embarrassed about my strange eating habits. And this is when I became an activist and started my first organization called Vegetarian Information Service. <clears throat> but uh, then, uh, as part of the vegetarian information service, we were doing little vegetarian conferences. And at these conferences, there would be these uh, folks arguing about this strange cult called animal rights, which was really weird. It was like talking about the rights of trees or rights of rocks. And uh, they had, of course, all read uh, Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, which came out in the same year as, uh, uh, as uh, the World Vegetarian Congress, 1975. And uh, uh, I was fascinated by these folks because, uh, first of all, their arguments although strange, they kind of made sense. And what I really liked about them was that they were ending up in the same place as the vegetarians, which is that we shouldn't eat animals. And uh, they had a lot of energy, which uh, the vegetarian folks did not have by then because this was five years after the World Congress and uh, now and the vegetarianism was kind of becoming ho-hum. Uh, mostly the, the local vegetarian societies were 
mostly social groups that would meet together for dinner or picnic. Uh, they were no longer involved in activism. So I looked to these uh, animal rights folks, even though they were a little strange, I looked to them for, to them for inspiration. And so I said, okay, why don't we have the next conference in 1980, in 1981, to include the animal rights folks and see what happens? Well, what happened was that the animal rights folks took over and that became uh, the, the, the founding event of the animal rights movement. That's when uh, uh, a young George Washington University student named Alex Pacheco, who had founded a little student organization named People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Uh, he had volunteered in a organization called Institute for Biomedical Research that was doing research on macaque monkeys by cutting off the nerves in their arms to see if they would regrow the nerves. Uh, he volunteered there and he spent his nights taking pictures and videos of the grizzly experiments. And at the conference, he brought these pictures and videos to Cleveland Amory, who then was the super guru of the American media and wasn't yet a vegetarian, but he was very sympathetic, in, sympathetic enough to come to the conference. And uh, Cleveland realized the explosive potential of these materials. And uh, he got on the phone and got his media buddies to carry these pictures and, uh, and the facts behind the pictures. And this is what brought both PETA and the animal rights movement to the conscience of the American people. This was what would basically institutionalize the animal rights movement. Jim, do you wanna unmute yourself? Did you wanna add something? Yes. Uh... Alex, uh, we're talking mainly about the American side of the movement. We must acknowledge that our British friends, you know, those people across the pond that speak English with a very weird accent, they were about 10 years ahead, ahead of us, weren't they, Alex? Weren't they doing yeah. radical things in the 60s? The they, hunt saboteurs? Yeah, they sure were. They sure yeah. Were. Animal Liberation Front, they were... They were doing illegal things. In fact, the leader, a guy named Ronnie Lee, went to prison for a year or two. So, yeah, they were really, as we say, kicking ass a good 10 or 15 years earlier over there than we were in the United States. Yeah, well, in fact, if you want to go way back. Yeah, was, I know. It was Henry Salt, who was yes. a Britisher. Well, I'm talking mainly about act activism, where people go out and smash laboratories and liberate farm animals and do unspeakably outrageous things. Henry Salt wrote a book, but nobody pays any attention to books anymore. So <laughs> who reads? <laughs> well, we read your books. Well, I hope so. <laughs> There's no, by the way, I make no money on the book. It's all donated to AAM and similar organizations. So every time you buy a book, you're helping an animal group because I'm rich. I don't need the money. <laughs> We're very grateful for your support, Jim. Oh, uh, well, it's the least I can do. Thank you for your thoughts. Alex, anything else you want to add to that? And, and, who do you see as sort of the up and coming? I mean, we're all in this movement equally together. There's no hierarchy in our movement, but anybody who you see as a particularly influential group or individuals, anything else that's on the leading edge of where this movement is going as we enter? So I have been uh, 
a little out of touch for the last three years or so. You know, before then, I used to run the annual animal rights conference, and I was probably the most informed person in the United States on the animal rights movement. I knew everybody, and I knew most of their secrets and their likes and dislikes, but that's now three or four years old. So I'm mostly retired, although still working on my memoir about my journey from the Holocaust to animal rights. Well, thank you so much for all the work that you have done. If anybody else sort of has some thoughts on that, you're welcome to share in the chat or raise your hand around, you know, what do you think or who do you think is moving the needle, helping us to move the needle? So all of us together are doing it, of course. And Alex, what do you think about like marches or really, do you think it's important to have these really, really large scale act, you know, in-person types of events uh, or not as much? Yeah, again, not, not as much as, as they were useful last century back in the eighties and nineties when we were still in the initial stage of social change when people had no concept of animal rights they didn't know that you that you should even care about animals and we had to kind of shake them up <laughs> and, but that's no longer the case i think people are aware you know even if they continue eating them they're at least aware that that it's an issue I got that. I, we've had, um, I know you know Robert Grillo um, in Chicago there, and he talks a lot about how we need to be more directly reaching people who are in power and people who are influential. Do you agree with that, that that needs to be more of a focus for our movement? Yeah. So speaking about people in power, I just learned today that uh, Vivek Ramaswa Ramaswamy is a vegetarian and an animal rights supporter. He's now considered number three in the Republican Party. In fact, I didn't watch the debate yesterday, but I, uh, reading the accounts for it from it, uh, it seems that uh, the other candidates, the, the other seven candidates all kind of ganged up on Vivek, which kind of implicates that they view him as the heir apparent to Trump. Mm. Well, we definitely need, would be great to have more politicians and people in power who are animal rights people, for sure. Well, and of course, my own congressman, uh, Jamie Raskin, is a vegan. Yeah. Ramaswamy better get on board with climate change, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's kind He's of a... <laughs> out of the out of this world yeah yeah that that's about the only nice thing i can say about him is is, is uh, being a vegetarian and animal rights supporter yeah <laughs> so we have a question in the chat alex for you um from noel hey noel what would you say is the most effective way for animal rights activists um the most effective the most best use of our time. She says she used to do cubes of truth, but realized there was no follow-up or any sort. Uh, and, and she never knew what became of the people she spoke to. And she's thankful for your talk tonight. Oh, thank you. Uh, that really depends on the individual. You know, we all have certain special skills. We all have certain special people who we can influence. Uh, you know, my, I had two strengths, and I utilized them both. One was my Holocaust background, which seems to give me some special speaking privileges, which other people don't have, and I use those. And uh, my other skill was organizing, and I used that to not only to organize farm, but to organize the national conference. But 
each of us has certain special skills and we need to find out what the skills are if we don't already know and use them to the, our best ability. And if you're not sure of that, you can reach out to AAM for a mentor. Absolutely. We can help you to know what your gifts and talents and where, where you may best serve in our movement because everybody has a place for sure and something to offer and bring. All right, any other questions? Did I miss any other questions? Or Alex, any other important points that you want to, I, I guess we'll wrap up in, in a little bit here. So I guess we're looking to sort of wrap up, but any other questions? No. <laughs> I think we've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> Is everybody just sort of soaking it all in? Tenebrae says, thank you so deeply and kindly for your time, Alex. And and thanks to me, thank you so much. And Jim Mason's sort of, what do they call it? Like in a movie when when somebody makes like a, an appearance. What's it? What Cam it? Cameo. A cameo. <laughs> cameo by Jim Mason. Well, I, I use every opportunity to see my best old pal, Alex. Oh, I love it. It's like a reunion almost, here. What, 50 years now, Alex, and we've been pals. Uh -huh. Almost somewhere back there, almost 50. Yeah, almost 50 years. I think we need to have a, a gathering of that online where all the, we'll get Karen Davis and we'll get uh, Ingrid Newkirk. <laughs> we'll all come in wheelchairs. We'll all, no, you're not in wheelchairs. You're vegans. Come on. <laughs> Healthy, vibrant. You're going to live to 100 or 200. I know, I know. All right. So not seeing any other questions. Everybody flex their vegan muscles. Ow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh not seeing any other questions then any final thoughts alex and i'll wrap up don't leave yet folks please if you would hold on because i do always have a few announcements to end with uh well the you know the last question is uh you know don't give up uh never give up uh <clears throat> i mean try to be as effective as you can using a, whatever skills you have, but uh, never give up. That's beautiful. We won't, not for the animals, right, folks? For the animals. Thank you, Alex, so much for everything that you've shared. I know that everybody appreciates it. So hold on, folks. Let me do some um, ending announcements. And I wanted to announce some upcoming workshops on September 7th. We have Behind the Lies, a former zoo employee exposes the truth about, about captivity. On September 28th, we have Managing Grief, which is a monthly support group for activists. October 12th, we have successful grassroots pressure campaigns with Donnie um, Moss and more workshops to be announced. And as I said, please check out our workshops, our previous workshops on our YouTube channel. Just look for Animal Activism Mentorship on YouTube and subscribe, please, while you're there. Reminder, we, we just got back from our in-person event in Portland, Oregon, and our next live large-scale in-person event is the Ohio Occurrence, September 1st through 3rd in and around Cincinnati. No experience required, but registration is required. So you'll find the events on our Facebook page and our website, or you can reach out to any uh, AAM mentor or, or team member. You're welcome to share in the chat your own Instagram handles or any other way that we can follow each other. Also, please consider becoming a patron by finding AAM on Patreon. Your donations allow AAM to continue to provide free educational resources for activists which ultimately saves more animals. And that wraps up another AAM workshop. Thank you, Alex, again, for your time and wisdom. Thank you all for being here and the tireless work you're doing for animals. Again, if you're interested in becoming a mentor or a mentee or want to get involved, please reach out to us.